If you've been with us in previous weeks, you will have seen that we're studying this letter from the Bible, Paul's letter to the Philippians. And what we do each week here in Public Bible Talk is we follow through, read through a book of the Bible and look at a part of that book each week and try to understand it and see what God is saying to us in that passage. You may not be used to this. I know that some of you aren't and some, for some of you it's new. And I hope that gradually you'll get to understand kind of how this works and why it's worth doing. And for others of you, I think you're already convinced about this. I hope that you'll stick with it as well. I want to think today about prayer and the things that people pray for. The content of people's prayers is very revealing. And if you are a praying person, I think I could probably tell a lot about you if I could listen to your prayers. And you could probably tell a lot about me as well. They reveal something of what is important to us. We pray about what really matters to us and what's on our heart. Consider these examples of prayers from the movies. Uh, first of all, a prayer in the movie Amadeus. Now, do you know this film? It's about Mozart, the composer, and his rivalry with a guy called Salieri. And Salieri is a religious man, and he recounts at one point his prayer from when he was young. And this is what he said. Lord, make me a great composer. Let me celebrate your glory through music and be celebrated myself. Make me famous through the world, dear God. Make me immortal. After I die, let people speak my name forever with love for what I wrote. In return, I vow I will give you my chastity, my industry, my deepest humility every hour of my life. And I will help my fellow man all I can. Amen. Oh, that's interesting. Well, what about this one? This is from another movie. It's another prayer about music. God of rock. <laughs> Thank you for this chance to kick ass. <laughs> we are your humble servants. Please give us the power to blow people's minds with our high voltage rock. Well, you may know that one. It's from School of Rock. And uh, it's the kind of prayer of a person who believes... As I want to believe that one great rock and roll show can change the world. Uh, <laughs> we pray for what we think is important. And here we have a prayer of Paul's. Paul writing to the Philippian Christians, telling them how he's been praying for them. And as we hear this prayer, I think it will challenge our priorities, whether you're a praying person or not, challenge your priorities about your life and for the lives of the people around you. Paul here prays as an apostle, an authorised representative of Jesus. And the prayer that he uh, tells us about is a model prayer for us too. So what does Paul pray? We, he uh, has talked earlier in the letter, as we heard read, about his prayers for the Philippian Christians, the church at Philippi. And he says that he thanks God for them. Uh, and he tells about why that is. He says he prays with joy for them because they have a partnership in the gospel, in the message about Jesus with him. But in verse 9, he finally actually gets around to telling them specifically what he has been praying for them. Verse 9, And this is my prayer, that your love may overflow more and more. The thing he prays for is overflowing love. Great abundance of love in their lives. And if you know anything about Jesus, you probably wouldn't be too surprised that Paul is praying this. Because Jesus makes clear that love is the crucial virtue in the lives of people who follow him. So, Jesus teaches that love is going to be the mark of his disciples. That's John 13. That the way that you can tell someone is a follower of Jesus is by the way that they love the people around them, the other followers of Jesus. Jesus teaches that love is the essence of the law, that really at the heart of the law of Moses that God gave to his people Israel is love. Love for God 
love for other people. The, that whole, the whole will of God expressed there in the law for how God's people should live is about love. And even more radical than that, Jesus taught that we should love our enemies. Matthew chapter 5, we should love our enemies and do good to those who persecute us. So Jesus made love so much part of the Christian life that it was, it was meant to be overflowing love for everyone. Love for God, yes. Love for other followers of Jesus, yes. But more than that, love for the world, love for even enemies, even persecutors. Christians were meant to be people marked by love. And so it's no wonder here that Paul prays that they might overflow in love. The thing is, he's not saying that these are not loving people. He's not saying, look, you, you're really not very loving and I need to pray for you because there's a, there's a big deficit there of love. Actually, the implication is, you already are people of love. But I'm praying that your love will just overflow more and more. That it will, it will just be a superfluity, a great fountain of love pouring out to other people. He's praying for overflowing love. That's how important it is, and that's the kind of love that he wants for those who follow Jesus. So love for God, love for each other, love for enemies. But Paul doesn't just pray for love. Look at what he says here. That your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight. Love uh, is not, not good enough on its own. It is simply not true that all you need is love. Okay? You need more than love, Paul says. You also need knowledge and insight. This is really important. Why do we need these things? Well, partly it's because we actually need to understand what love is about. We tend to assume that we know what love is, but actually love is something that we need to learn. And it's something that we need to learn through our knowledge of God, especially our knowledge of Jesus. Because in the Bible it says that actually Jesus is the one who really reveals what love is and what love is all about. Listen to what John says in his first letter. This is 1 John 3.16. Not John 3.16. 1 John 3.16. We know love by this, he says, we know love by this, that he, that Jesus laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for one another we know love by this that Jesus laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for one another so Jesus shows us what love is all about and we are meant to imitate his example so to become a truly loving person means following the person who is the most loving person that ever was And learning from Him, learning about Him, gaining knowledge so that you can love like Jesus. So we need to learn about God and God's ways. We need to learn about Jesus specifically so we can grow in our understanding of what love is. But it's not just that. It's not just knowledge that we need, as important as that is, but also insight. And this is a kind of wisdom word. We need discernment. We need understanding. We need wisdom. And the reason is because love is difficult. Love is tricky. The world is a complicated place. People are complicated. To love others is actually not easy at all. The thinker Edward de Bono uh, said that he really thought that in terms of the way we treat other people, love was probably not what we should aim for, that love was just too tricky a concept that really what we should go for in terms of our relationships with other people was respect. He said, let's make respect the primary category. Uh, And while I disagree with him, and I think obviously Paul disagrees with him, uh, I think at the very least what he was doing was acknowledging that this is not an easy thing to do, that love love is difficult, love is complicated. And so we actually need wisdom. To know what to do. One of the things that we inherit uh, as uh, people who grow up in Australia or people who have some kind of inheritance from Western culture is that we tend to uh, have a romantic view of love. 
and I mean a big R romantic view of love uh, from the romantic period and what the romantics thought, what romanticism was about was about the, the, the kind of purity of emotion that is that we should just act in accord with our emotions and we should follow our feelings and of course this leads to a view of love which you know where real love is kind of spontaneous and uncontrollable and untamable you know that kind of thing so you know you think of uh, Wuthering Heights and you know Heathcliff and all of that kind of uh, uncontrollable love and elemental kind of stuff right but no that's not what, what love is really about of course love is emotional it's got an emotional content but it's more than that it's a commitment to other people's good at your own cost and that kind of commitment you know needs to be lived out in an intelligent thoughtful way you can do it in a deliberate way a thoughtful and informed way and so that's what we're trying to do, to learn what love is and then to learn the wisdom to put that into practice. So let me give you an example. I think one of the things that, uh, is where love is hard is what happens when someone does something to hurt you or harm you or upset you? How do you respond to that with love? One of the things you may need to do is to confront that person or rebuke that person. Or perhaps you've seen someone do something hurtful to someone else. One of the loving things that you might do is confront them. It's not loving to let them continue in their ways. It's not loving to uh, in, some, in any way encourage them to continue in that behaviour. But the confrontation is not something that will necessarily feel very loving. It's not going to be, oh, I just... I think you're wrong. <laughs> I just think you're wrong. No, it's not going to be like that. It's going to be difficult. It's going to take some thought. And it's going to take some discernment about exactly what to say and so on. In other words, love in practice is going to be something where you need wisdom and knowledge. So that's what we're trying to do, learn those things. And that's partly why we meet here week by week studying the Bible or in our Bible studies and so on that we're thirsting for the knowledge that will lead to loving lives. So love needs knowledge, but it's also worth saying that knowledge needs love as well. It's not any value to you to accumulate lots of Bible knowledge and then not put it into practice in your life, in loving other people. Okay, so Paul prays for love, overflowing love with knowledge and insight. And he's got a goal in mind when he prays this prayer. There's a goal in mind, and the goal is really important and affects our thinking about the whole thing. Uh, yesterday I went to see part of the Melbourne Now exhibition. You've heard of Melbourne Now? It's a huge exhibition at the NGV, National Gallery of Victoria Galleries, and uh, lots and lots of contemporary Melbourne art. And one of the things that uh, I saw, which was one of the best things, there's a lot of pretty average, <laughs> I'm afraid, exhibits there. But there's some great things. And one of them, it's a video installation. You go into this dark room, and the video is uh, something that a guy's put together in Melbourne laneways. And it just shows, the camera just moves very slowly and steadily down some of the laneways in the city and in some of the inner suburbs. You know, the laneways with the blue stones and that kind of, that kind of thing. And so it moves down these and uh, it's just various clips of those laneways spliced together to make a kind of continuous journey. And it's really interesting, you move slowly down these lanes, it's kind of creepy, uh, kind of strange, you wonder where it's all going. Uh, but eventually uh, you do see uh, up ahead a gate and you come up to it and it's just a black uh, wrought iron gate and you just stop up against it and that's where it ends so you've gone on this journey through all these laneways it's all pretty exciting you don't know what's going to happen um, in the end actually nothing really <laughs> uh, which is somewhat disappointing I, I think that changes your thinking about the whole thing uh, it means I think the implication I think is that you know here that it's the journey that's the real thing uh, in the end it's not that interesting or hopeful at all right? uh, but Paul's view is quite different from that. He's not 
I mean, he's interested in the journey, sure, but really he's interested in the end point. Where is this all heading towards? Where is a life of love? Where is a life of love heading towards? Uh, well, what does he say here? Uh, this is my prayer that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help you determine what is best so that in the day of Christ you may be pure and blameless having produced the harvest of righteousness. Where is this all headed towards? Paul says that it's headed towards the day of Christ. What does he mean by that? Well, this phrase, the day of Christ, is uh, Paul's little shorthand phrase, uh, which catches up a whole lot of stuff. The day of Christ is the day when Jesus returns. It's the day of judgment. It's the day when God puts all things right with his world, the day when all things are brought to account. In the judgment on that day, the day of Christ, uh, the Bible says that people will certainly be judged about whether they belong to God or not. There's a great division of those who belong to Jesus and those who do not. But it's more than that, actually. It's also that everything is brought into judgment. That everything in the world, that everything that a person has said and thought and done, all of these things are brought out into the open. Jesus says there's there's nothing hidden that won't be made known. All of these things are brought out into the open and uh, each thing will get its proper acknowledgement and reward if that is appropriate. That this is part of what it means for God to be completely just. That at the day of Christ everything will receive its due. And included in that are the things that Christians do in their lives, the way Christians live, all of that will be brought out into the open uh, and that will be acknowledged uh, before God. And what Paul particularly has in mind for the Christians on that day is a couple of things here. First of all, that they may be pure and blameless. That is, that the Christians would have lived lives where they have avoided sin, where they've refrained from evil where they've kept themselves pure in their thinking and in their acting, where they're blameless, that is, that no one can... There's nothing for anyone to point a finger at them about for what they've done. There's nothing that they could be accused of. Now, I think to many people who aren't Christians, this is basically what the Christian life is about. It's about avoiding sin. And I want to say that that is at least half true, partly true that it really is about keeping yourself pure and blameless if you are a follower of Jesus. And that one of the reasons you need love and knowledge and discernment is so that you can avoid what is evil, avoid what is wrong, avoid what is harmful, avoid those things which come under the category of sin. So Paul is praying for them that they might be discerning, that they might know what is best, uh, in order that they might avoid what is not best, avoid what is evil. So he wants them to be pure and blameless at the Day of Judgment. But more than that, also, he prays that they might produce, this is verse 11, the harvest of righteousness. The harvest of righteousness. And this is the more positive side of the Christian life. So if part of the Christian life is avoiding evil, it's not only that, it's actually also doing what is right, doing what is good. This phrase, the harvest of righteousness, or the fruit of righteousness, is a little bit ambiguous. Uh, It could mean the harvest that comes from being a righteous person, that is, Paul's going to later on in the letter talk about how a person becomes righteous before God through faith in Jesus, and maybe that's what he's talking about here, that this is the kind of life you live if you're a person who is right with God. Or he, he may mean the harvest of righteousness in the sense of the harvest that is righteousness, that is, that the harvest that is the good things, the right things that you do. And I think it's probably the latter, actually because there are a few times in the Old Testament where this phrase, fruit of righteousness or harvest of righteousness, is used. And it's fairly clear it's talking about the good things that a person does in their life. So Paul is saying here, uh, he, he prays for them, not only that they'll avoid evil, but that there'll be a harvest of righteousness in their life. The image is of a farmer or a vine grower or someone taking care of their plants, their crops, until that day when the harvest is ready, when all of that reaches maturity and it's ready to be harvested. And it pictures the day of Christ as a harvest day 
when all the good things that you have carefully done in your life are, uh, are collected together by God, if you like, are, are brought together by God uh, and acknowledged as the things that you've done in your life. How does someone produce a harvest of righteousness? Well, Paul says here, here that it comes through Jesus Christ. That is, he's not just saying, look, you, you really need to you know, be a bit better. You need to be better people. He's not saying that. He's saying, this is something that happens to you when you belong to Jesus. This is something that happens to you when you follow Jesus and put your trust in Jesus. That Jesus actually helps you to live in the right way. That he teaches us and he demonstrates for us and he gives us his spirit so that we can produce a harvest in our life. That is what Jesus is doing in the life of his followers now, helping them to produce a harvest of righteousness. And what is the end goal in all of this? What is, what is all this headed towards? The, what's the reason for it? Well, look at what Paul says right at the end there. Having produced the harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. What's the point of living a good life? What's the point of avoiding sin in your life? What's the point of loving others? Well, look, th these are good things in themselves. Good for you, yes. But ultimately, Paul says, what it's about is God's praise and glory. That is, that the good things that you do in your life, when they are brought to account on that day of Christ, will be for the praise and glory of God. It's a picture where basically your whole life, your whole life, everything about you, is presented to God as an act of worship on that day. So we tend to think of worship as something that is going on now, right? Something that you do now in your life, you worship God and kind of that's it. But Paul's picture here is very more focused towards the end, that in fact your whole life, everything about you is going to be ultimately presented to God as worship. And so of course we want it to be good worship. We want it to be appropriate worship of God. That through Jesus Christ we'll have produced a life of love, a life of righteousness for God's glory. Salieri in his prayer, what, what did he pray for? Well, he prayed for his own glory, didn't he? That everyone will remember me, he said. But actually, the Christian's prayer about the end is that God will be glorified by my life. That God will be glorified by your life. Okay, well, I hope you can see that Paul's prayer actually challenges us about what really matters in our lives. It certainly challenges us about our prayers, our prayers for ourselves and our prayers for each other. I don't know, if you're a praying person, what kind of things you pray for when you pray for other people. I think that they tend to be emergency prayers. Is that right? That we pray for someone when they're sick or when they ask us to pray you know, for their assignment uh, or their family member who is struggling in some way, something like that. And these are... All perfectly reasonable prayers. These are prayers that God, our Heavenly Father, wants to hear. But it is a challenge for us to hear Paul praying for something much more long-term than that. He's praying for these people that their whole lives will be able to be presented to God as worship on the last day. And that should challenge us about the way we pray for others as well. That if you're a praying person, that you will be asking God... Not just for what, some, what your friend or your family member or whatever needs today or tomorrow or next week. But that you'll be praying for the kind of person that they, that they become through the course of their life. The kind of things that they will do through their whole life. The kind of person that they will be. You're praying that they will be pure and blameless. Are you praying that they will produce a harvest of righteousness? But I think this passage challenges us about more than our prayers, as important as that is. It actually challenges us about what we think really matters. As I said at the start, we tend to pray about what is really important. Paul seems to be saying, this is really important. Is your life focused on the kind of worship that it is 
that's going to be offered to God in the end. I find that very challenging, very different from the way I normally think of my life and my normal preoccupations. Which tend to be so much more about myself uh, in the sense of what I need now, what I need next, and barely touching on what kind of person I'm going to be and become over the longer term. If this was a problem in Paul's day, then surely it's more of a problem in our day. We, we, we are instant satisfaction people. We want it all and we want it now. And Paul's view is so different. The kind of person you'll become over the decades of your life, the kind of life that will be offered to God on the day of Christ. If you're someone who's not a follower of Jesus, not a Christian person, I think there is a challenge for you here as well. There is a day of Christ. There is a day of judgment that you will face. How will you face that day? How will you be able to face Jesus the judge? The answer the Bible gives is by putting your trust in him. Putting your trust in Jesus allows you to face that day with confidence. If you are already a follower of Jesus, the challenge is to refocus our lives on what really matters. I'm going to give you a moment to have a think about whether there's any questions you'd like to ask. I'm going to grab a drink and we'll have some time for questions. Okay, would anyone like to ask about what we've talked about today or anything from the series so far? understand that he has been thanking God as well and he's been thanking God in terms of some of the things he said about his relationship with them. So he doesn't exactly say this is what I said to God but you can pick up I think one of the, thing, the things that he was thankful for. So he would have said you know thank you that the those Christians at Philippi are partners with me in the gospel. Yeah that kind of thing. So yes in some ways you could say the whole passage is about Paul's prayers, but in verse 9 he then actually says, and this is what I've been asking. Yeah. yeah. Verse 11 says, <clears throat> having produced the harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. How are we supposed to read that that comes through Jesus Christ? Yeah. Uh, how do we read the phrase, uh, the harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ? Yeah, so I think what I wanted to say was that uh, the lives that we live come to us through Jesus Christ, that is through our connection with Jesus by faith. But if someone believes in Jesus, that then begins to change their life and transform their life. So I think through Jesus Christ is short there, short for through a relationship with Jesus Christ and through the, the power of Jesus Christ. Yeah. So that's why I wanted to say that the connection with Jesus is so necessary for a life of righteousness not just something we do on our own initiative, under our, our own power. Okay, next week I'm going to talk a bit about death. So you might have friends that this might be good to bring them along to, uh, just some, something helpful about how to face death. It's a serious topic, but it's just a really important one. And uh, also... Uh, opportunity to keep studying this in your in Bible study groups as well. Let me pray and I'll hand back to Hannah. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord God, Heavenly Father, for these words of this prayer and the challenge it is for what really matters in our life. We do pray 
uh, that you would help us to be focused on the day of Christ and that through Jesus we might produce that harvest of righteousness for your glory. We pray for anyone here who's searching for you, that you would help them to find you through Jesus, your Son. We pray in his name. Amen. Amen.